Now I want you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke chapter 4. And follow along as I read the first 14 verses. The Gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter, beginning with the first verse and reading through verse 14. Continuing our series on Wake Up to the Supernatural, dealing with the origin, the operation, and the overcoming of Satan. And I feel that before we move into the area of demons and spirits and the occult and wind this thing up, that we need to take a, tonight with this matter of temptation. And I want us to address our attention to the Gospel of Luke chapter 4 and the first 14 verses, beginning at verse 1. Now, the account of the temptation of Jesus is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark gives only a couple of verses to it, but these three gospel writers record the incident, and Luke gives a very complete account of the temptation, beginning in verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. That gives you an indication of the tremendous power available to the devil in this matter of tempting. In a moment of time, in the twinkling of an eye, in a flash, he was able to throw on the screen all the kingdoms of the world, so Jesus could see them. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to, a, to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. Now, the major difference between Matthew's account and Luke's account is in the chronology of it. We're going to take Matthew's chronology of that temptation and uh, where Luke puts the last temptation, Matthew puts it second and reverses just the last two. When God created man, he created man with certain abilities, certain faculties, and certain resources, and created man with the ability to choose. Now, God sees to it that every human being passes through a time of conflict to see, to determine whether or not man will use his God-given abilities and faculties and resources to glorify himself or to glorify God. Every human being must pass through this time of conflict to determine whether or not he is going to satisfy himself or he is going to glorify God. Now, the Bible calls this period of conflict temptation. Originally, the word tempt mean to, meant to make a search, which to me is highly 
instructive in this matter of temptation. When the devil was tempting Jesus, he was searching Jesus. He was making a search to see if there were any flaws in the character of Jesus. He was trying to see if there were some weak spots in Jesus. He was making a search. And when God allows us to be tempted in that same way, God is searching us. He is making a search to determine whether or not we're going to use all that God has given us to satisfy ourselves or whether or not to glorify God. Now, the temptation of Jesus is good for two reasons. First of all, it establishes the fact there is a devil. If we didn't already have that fact established just by experience, we know there must, there is some kind of power, some kind of force and influence in the world which is always influencing us and drawing us. But I think one of the primary reasons that the temptation occurred as it did is Jesus was dragging the devil out into the light so all of us could look at him and see that he was there and also see how he operates. And what Jesus was doing in the wilderness was forcing the devil to come out into the open. And we have here, outside of Genesis chapter 3, the most complete picture of the devil's method of temptation that you'll have in the Word of God. But not only is the temptation of Jesus instructed because it drags the devil out and puts him in the spotlight so we can examine him, but also the temptation of Jesus is a preview of our own temptation. It is a preview and a prophecy of our own temptation. Now, what I want to do before I get into the body of the message tonight is to just give you some things about temptation as seen in the experience of Jesus. Five things about it. First of all, temptation is a part of the divine plan for your life. I think it is important that every Christian understand this. Temptation is a part of the divine plan. Notice what he says in verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Matthew says uh, something similar in Matthew chapter 4 and the first verse. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Jesus just didn't happen to fall into temptation, to accidentally bump into the devil. The Spirit of God led him into the wilderness for the specific purpose of being tempted. I like the way Mark puts it in chapter 1 and verse 12. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan. The Spirit of God drove Jesus into the wilderness. Why? because it was a part and is a part of the divine plan for us to be tempted. Now put it down, God is going to see to it that you're tempted. A lot of us look upon temptation as one of these big bad dogs. And we're walking down the street one day and we see this big bad dog and he's sound asleep under a tree in the shade. And you know, we think that if we just tiptoe lightly and quietly around him. We won't arouse him and we'll get by all right. And there are a great many Christians that think that temptation is like that. It's like a big bad dog sound asleep and if we're careful enough and if we tiptoe around enough, we'll never wake up the devil and he'll never tempt us. I want you to know tonight, God is going to see to it that you're tempted because until you're tempted, your faith isn't worth anything. You read 1 Peter chapter 1, and he says right now you're in heaviness through many temptations that your faith, which is more precious than gold, might be proven strong and steadfast to the praise of God the Father. Faith that is not tested and faith that is not tried and tempted is of no value whatsoever in the economy of God. And if God is going to be pleased with my faith, that must be faith that has been tested and tried and stood that test and come out victoriously. You put it down, Christian. God is going to see to it that you're tempted because it is a part of the divine plan of your life. All right? Second thing about temptation is this. Temptation often comes to us after our greatest spiritual experiences. Now, all of this is introduction, but it is important introduction. You need to know about the operation methods of the devil. Temptation 
often comes to us after our greatest spiritual experiences. Every one of these three gospel writers stress, emphasize the time of the temptation. In Mark chapter 1, listen, and immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Notice that word, immediately. Immediately after what? All right, let's back up. It's the record of Jesus being baptized. Three great pinnacles in the ministry of Jesus. Number one, baptized by John in Jordan to fulfill all righteousness. Number two, the heavens open, the Spirit of God coming down, anointing Jesus. Number three, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You talk about a mountaintop experience. Three, three pinnacles of experiences, highest that Jesus had ever known. And immediately, the Spirit of God drove him into the wilderness to be tempted. Every one of those three writers stressed the time of the temptation was after this high spiritual experience of Jesus. Now get ready. Watch out. Some of you have been defeated and you've yielded a temptation simply because you were unaware at this point. I like to think of Elijah on Mount Carmel. Now you talk about boldness, you talk about courage, and you talk about a high hour of revival. It happened on Mount Carmel when Elijah, who had stopped up the waters of heaven for three and a half years, and he stood and challenged the prophets of Baal, and he said, I'll bet you my God can burn more than your God can. He challenged all the gods, and he bet his life on it. Do you know what would have happened if God hadn't answered by fire? They'd have cut Elijah's head off. I heard a preacher in Philadelphia say, Are you willing to stake your life on revival? Dug the hole, the trenches, put the bullock in it, put the wood in it, and then you know what he did? He poured water all over it, making it as hard as possible for God to do. Really putting God to the test. Most of us would have wanted to dry it for three days out in the sun before we'd been willing to give God a chance. <laughs> Elijah said, if my God is not a God that can't burn water, he's no God. And that's right. That's right. Listen, you get God in a position where he has to perform a miracle to get you out, and then you're on shouting ground. You're now where God can work. That's the way God always works. You check it out through the Bible. He always comes into a situation where only a miracle can help. Well, amen, he's in the miracle-making business. So Elijah douses that wood with water, and then it calls for God to answer by fire. God did it. Man, the fire fell and consumed the wood, consumed the sacrifice, and 450 heads rolled in the valley that day, and there was revival. And all the people of God, those backslidden, idolatrous, idolatrous people, shouted out, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Well... Old Elijah's arrived, hadn't he? Got the devil scared to death. The next time I read my Bible, I find Elijah running from a woman. <laughs> scared to death of Jezebel. <laughs> sitting under a juniper tree saying, Oh, Lord, let me die. <laughs> now, you know, Elijah didn't mean that. You know how I knew he meant it? That's what a Jezebel wanted to do. If Elijah really wanted to die, he, uh, Eli uh, Jezebel would gladly have obliged him. <laughs> He didn't really want to die. He just was depressed, melancholy, down in the valley. You talk about the blahs, he had them. But you need to understand that it was after Elijah's highest spiritual experience that he took a nose dive and hit the bottom. And temptation often comes to us after our highest spiritual experiences to which many of you can testify tonight if I gave you the chance. Don't ever... Don't ever think that simply because you've been filled with the Spirit and you've been miraculously used of God that this gives you an immunity against temptation. It does not. Do you know what? Temptation is a compliment the devil pays you. I thought that was pretty good when I thought of it. <laughs> Let me say that again. Temptation is a compliment from the devil. You think about it, after a while it'll come across to you. Man, 
The devil's afraid of you. You threaten him. The devil has something you want. You're a threat to him, and so he tempts you. And the more spiritual you become, the more devoted to Jesus you become, the more effective God makes you, the more you're used of God, the more the devil is going to tempt you, attack you, and assault you. Oh, don't let us ever be guilty of relaxing and thinking that the devil has been scared off from us. He never is. He always comes back. Temptation often comes after our highest hours. Number three, temptation many times attacks us at our strongest point. You know, I think we're making a big mistake many times. We're, we're, we guard our weak points. The devil doesn't attack you at your weak points. Why should he? They're exactly what he wants them to be. He wants your strong points to become weak points. The devil attacks you at your strong points. That's revealed in the temptation of Jesus. The devil came to Jesus. He had been fasting for 40 days, hadn't had anything to eat. And they tell us that these little limestones that used to would lie around in the desert were in the, were in the shape of loaves. And so you could look at them and they would remind you of loaves of bread. And the devil comes to Jesus and he says, uh, listen, now, you've been up here fasting and praying for 40 days. Now your body is really hungering. It's not just hunger pains that you feel, but there is a real body hunger. And you know you can go for 38 to 40 days without eating and you won't starve to death. And if you fast the first few days, what you feel and think is hunger pain is not really hunger pain at all. That's just your stomach shrinking up and that makes, it, it makes you feel like it's hunger pain. But your body can live off of all the energy it has stored up. And in about 38 to 40 days, it will have exhausted all that was stored up. And that's where hunger really sets in, true hunger. And if you go beyond that, then you'll starve to death. That's where Jesus was. Jesus was at the point of starving to death. And he said to Jesus, if you're the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, friend, that would not have been a temptation to me at all. If I had been in the place where Jesus was, coming off a 40-day fast at the point, at the point of starvation, and the devil had come to me and said, Ron, if you're so hungry, look at those stones down there. They kind of remind you of bread anyway. Why don't, why don't you just command that those stones be made bread? That would not have been a temptation to me because I couldn't have done it if I had wanted to. <laughs> that's a weak point but Jesus could have done it and you watch out that part of your life that you think is so strong now listen some of you think your marriage is so strong and you look out at other marriages that are breaking up and you sit back and you wrap yourself up in that warm blanket of security saying that'll never happen to me that'll never happen to me and you go ahead and take it for granted you watch out that's exactly where the devil is going to strike some of you think that you're so spiritual you could never commit certain sins that's exactly where the devil is going to attack you. Temptation often, most of the time, attacks us at our strongest points. Now, number four, we're never finished with temptation. We're never finished with it. Look in Luke chapter 4 and verse 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And the Greek there means for a more convenient time until a more convenient time. You're never done with temptation. And the devil may come to you today and tempt you, and you may resist him and emerge victoriously on the other side, and the devil will flee from you, James 4, 7 says, but he is only retreating and regrouping. That's all he's doing. And he will wait until a more convenient season. We're never done with temptation. And number five, temptation prepares us for service. Now look at Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now notice verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. And every one of these three gospel writers, immediately after his temptation, they record his miraculous ministry right after that. 
He went in full of the Holy Spirit, that's right, led by the Spirit, but he emerged in the power of the Holy Spirit and his fame spread throughout all Galilee. People were healed and the lame did walk and the blind saw and the deaf heard. Temptation prepares us for service. Now, that's the introduction. The devil has only three knots when he approaches the heart of a human being. The devil has only three knots. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 13 it says, And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Now when it says that the devil ended all the temptation, it does not mean that the devil never again tempted Jesus because we know he did. Over and over again he tempted him. But what that expression, he ended all the temptation, means is this, that the devil exhausted all of his temptation. The devil emptied his gun into the Son of God, and when he did, this Jesus was still standing. The devil threw everything he had at Jesus. He didn't have anything else to tempt him with. He ended, he used everything he had. He completely exhausted every temptation he had. And that's what that means. So I can just look back and see what those temptations were, and I'll know every trick the devil has in his book. And the devil only has three shots in his gun. He's only got three arrows in his quiver. He only has three knocks on the door of the human heart. And that's what I want us to look at now. You've got to realize how Jesus is going to approach you. Knock number one. is the knock of personal, I mean rather physical, appetite. When the devil approaches us to tempt us, one of his methods, one of the knocks trying to get into your heart is he appeals to the physical appetite. Physical appetite. Let's flip back to Genesis chapter 3. You listen as I read this recording the temptation that the devil first gave to Eve. And we're going to see something in a minute. The devil has never changed his temptation, you see. He doesn't have but three temptations. That's all he has. Now, these temptations that come to you may take a thousand forms, but they're really only three. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's, knowing good and evil. Now notice verse 6. And when the woman saw that it was the tree was good for food, physical appetite, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. The devil discovered a long time ago that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Let's listen now to John, 1 John chapter 2. You have in 1 John chapter 2 a summary of all that is in the world. If you want to know what all is in the world, he sums it up in three statements. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now let's look at those for just a moment. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, she saw that it was good for food. The lust of the eyes, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and the pride of life, and a tree desired to make one wise. You see? And we'll see the same thing in Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4. He said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made for bread. Feed yourself the lust of the flesh. Cast yourself off the pinnacle, and everybody will see you. The lust of the eyes. Fall down and worship me and I'll give you all these kingdoms, the pride of life. That's all the devil has to offer. And the first knock 
He appeals to physical appetite. When Jesus was in the gar was in the wilderness, he was hungry. The devil came to him and said, "Command these stones be made into bread." Now listen. The power of that temptation is this: that there's not anything wrong with turning stones into bread. Absolutely not a thing wrong with turning stones into bread, except for Jesus. Now, very briefly, let me tell you what this temptation is. The devil comes to you, and here's what makes it so powerful. The devil comes to you and says, "Hey, listen, you have physical appetites, hungry, thirsty, sex, all of these needs. You have physical appetites, and what's more, God has given you these physical appetites. God made me like I am, didn't He?" Now, the clincher is, this is the clincher. God has not only made you like this with physical appetites, God has also made it possible for you to satisfy those appetites. See? Now, friends, whether you realize it or not, that is the logic of the devil. On the one hand, God made me with these physical appetites. Well, maybe God doesn't want me to satisfy these appetites. No, that can't be true because for every appetite God gave me, He also made a way for me to satisfy that appetite. Well, then, if God made me with these appetites and also God made provision for that appetite, what in the world is wrong with that? With satisfying that appetite. This is what the Corinthians were saying, by the way. This is why they were carnal, and this is always the reasoning of a carnal Christian. Food for the stomach and stomach for the food. That's what they were saying, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. God made the stomach, and God also made food for the stomach. God made food, He also made a stomach for the food to go in. So there can certainly be not anything wrong with satisfying, indulging, gratifying every physical appetite that you have because God gave it to you, and God also made it where you could satisfy that appetite. But Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and says, Stomach for food, the food for the stomach, but the body is the Lord's. And that's the clincher right there. All right. The temptation is this. What's going to determine how you live your life? Your stomach or the will of God? That's the temptation. Are you going to be brought down to the level of an animal in the field? And are you going to let your physical drives and appetites and needs dictate to you? Are you going to use the energy, the resources, and the abilities that God has given you? Are you going to use those selfishly? Or are you going to subordinate those to the will of God? It's a question, my friends, of which means most in your life. Your own physical needs and satisfying them are the Word of God. That's why Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And I'll tell you, most of us tonight are living like Paul said. Some people were living in Philippians chapter 3. Their God is their belly. Their God is their appetite. And if the appetite craves this, and if the physical needs crave this, satisfy it. Don't give any thought to what God would have you to do. And I believe that probably the first line of attack the devil gives to us is along this line of the physical appetites. All right, let's move on to the second knock. Not only does the devil attack us in the area of our physical appetites, but he attacks us in the area of our spiritual allegiance to God. He attacks our faith in God. Now, this temptation, you'll miss the purpose of it. You'll miss the meaning of it if you're not careful. All right, let's look in verse 9. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from the hence. For it is written, He shall give His angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said, You are not supposed to tempt God. Now what, does, what was that temptation all about? 
the devil quoted a messianic psalm and said the psalm prophesied that God the Father would give his angels charge over you. He's going to give you a guardian angel, a bodyguard, and he wasn't going to let you even stub your toe. Now he says, now don't miss it, listen. He says, Jesus, you better find out if God really means what he says. Prove it. Now I wrote this down so I wouldn't miss it. This is the temptation. I want you to listen carefully. The devil was saying, if God leaves a question of life unanswered, he must not really be God or good. Now let me read that again. The temptation here is attacking your faith in God. The devil is saying, Jesus, how do you know God really means what he says? You better test it and see. The devil is saying, if God leaves a question of life unanswered, he must not really be God or good. Tragedy comes to your life. You cannot understand why you look up into heaven and you say, oh God, why has this tragedy come to me? And there's no answer. And the devil comes in. And you begin to doubt. I know Christians who give their all to Christ and then trouble comes, difficulties parade all about them. And life begins to tumble in and like Job, they lift up their voice to God and cry to God, why is this happening to me? And God never answers. God never answers. So the devil comes in the person of Job's wife and says, why don't you just curse God and die? Well, you know, this is exactly what Satan said to Eve in the garden. Satan said, listen, I tell you what, why doesn't God want you to eat of that? God's withholding something from you. He knows that if you eat of that, he knows if you eat of that, you're going to be like he is, and God is withholding something from you. What was he doing? He was trying to cast doubt upon her faith in God. You ever heard a teenager say why he rebels against his parents? Why, well, man, my parents, they're, they're keeping me from having a good time. And this is what the devil comes to a teenager trying to get him to be rebellious. Say, listen, your parents, you're, they're holding back on you. They just want to keep you under their thumb. They want to put you down. They just don't want to see you having a good time. You're never going to get all the good that's in life as long as you're a nice little boy or girl. That's what the devil says. Now listen, if your faith has to be proven by God, it's not real faith. I don't know about you, but I, to me, the greatest demonstration of faith is when Job lifted up his voice and said, If he slay me, yet will I trust him. When they threw those three Hebrew children in the fire furnace, they said, Our God will deliver us, but if not... But if not, that's all right. Better to burn up walking with the Son of Man. But if not, you see. Now the devil comes and he attacks you at your spiritual allegiance and tries to get you to tempt God. Now I want to ask you a question tonight. What kind of faith do you have? Does God have to prove himself to you? Does he? Does he? Can you say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I serve him? Can you say with the three Hebrew children, God will deliver me, but if not? Not number three. The devil appeals to our personal ambition. Our personal ambition. And oh my, how powerful this is. Verse 5, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Have you ever thought what a tremendous temptation that must have been? I can't even begin to comprehend how that must have just torn at the very fiber of his being. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever see anything you really want? Hmm? You ever go somewhere? You ever visited in somebody's mansion? Boy, I'd like to have that. 
Have you ever? You ever been driving down the street in your old clinker? Oh, listen. The other day I was driving along and... Boy, just like a fish cutting through the water came by me a white El Dorado Cadillac. You ever say anything that you really want? Man, I'd like to have that. Can you imagine what it must have been? Now, let me ask you something, friends. What if the devil came to you and said, Hey, I'll give you anything you want. Just compromise. Now, here, here's the heart of this temptation. Listen. Oh, don't miss this, friends. The devil was not asking Jesus to abandon his mission. He was asking him to fulfill his mission his way. The devil was not asking Jesus to abandon his mission. He was asking him to compromise to accomplish it. <clears throat> and if the devil were to come to you, teenager, and say, Hey, I'm not asking you to renounce Jesus. I'm not asking you to give up your faith. But listen, would you like to be the most popular girl in school? Would you like to get that contract? Would you like to get that promotion in business? Would you like to be invited out by the boss? I'm not asking you to renounce Christ or give up serving as a deacon or teaching your class. Just compromise a little. Appealing to the personal ambition. Appealing to the personal ambition. Brother Jack Taylor told about a fellow preacher and got filled with the Spirit. God marvelously moved in his life and he went back to his church and he started preaching that. Started preaching every Christian ought to be filled with the Spirit. One of his deacons came up to him and after a few weeks of that and said, Now preacher, I've been with you up to this point. And he says, What you're preaching and what you're teaching is upsetting a lot of us folks and I'm not with you anymore. Well, that young pastor just kind of backed down and he began getting off of that and preaching other things. It wasn't too long after that that the deacon came up and patted him on the back. He said, you're doing a good job, Pastor. And he said, to show our appreciation, some of us are taking up some money. We're going to send you and your wife to the Holy Land. This preacher made a mistake of going to one of these prayer retreats. God got hold of him, went up to Jack, and he said, Listen, you know what God told me tonight? He said, That's blood money. And he said, I'm going back and tell them they can have their Holy Land trip and preach on the filling of the Holy Spirit. The devil's not asking you to go to hell. The devil isn't asking you to renounce your faith asking you to compromise a little. That's all. To get what you want. And some of you would do it to get what you want. Some of you have already done it to get what you want. Oh, the devil's smart. Now listen, anytime the devil comes, only three knocks he has. He'll either appeal to your physical appetite he will attack your spiritual allegiance, your faith in God, or he will appeal to your personal ambition. And every time Jesus repelled the attack of the devil and came through on the other side victorious, by how? Not just quoting the Word of God, but by obeying the Word of God. We don't have time to say all of this, but just let me say this one thing. To me, the significance of the temptation of Jesus is this. Jesus went into that temptation with two things. He went in filled with the Spirit, 
and fill with the Word of God. I want you to know that when the devil tempted Jesus, Jesus Christ did not overcome him by appealing to his supernatural powers. He didn't, he didn't work one miracle. He did not appeal to his deity. Jesus overcame Satan with two things. The same two things that every believer has. The Spirit of God and the Word of God. And when Jesus did that, Jesus was saying to me, Listen, you don't need to be the Son of God. You don't need to be divine. You don't need miracles to overcome the devil. I marched into that wilderness. I laid aside all the prerogatives that I had as a child of God. I marched into the face of Satan with two weapons, the Word of God and the Spirit of God, and you have the same thing. I showed you how to do it. I wouldn't get any comfort at all out of the temptation of Jesus if Jesus had used his divine powers to overcome the devil. But you see what Jesus was doing? Jesus was cutting a path through the forest for me. Jesus said, Son, I'm going on before you. And as you walk through there, you just look for those little hash marks on the tree and you see the way I did it and you do it the way I do it. Praise the Lamb of God. Isn't that right? Amen. Man. Boy. Got everything He's got. Do what He did. Just meet the devil in the power of the Spirit. Obey the Word of God. Overcoming. Victorious. Has it been so in your life? Has it? Have you compromised? Well, the great thing about it is that when we do yield and we don't rise to our resources in Jesus and we do yield and we sin, the promise is if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from our sins, to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now listen, if you've failed, if you've sinned, just confess it to God. And confession brings cleansing and forgiveness. Thank you for listening to this message by Ron Dunn. Ron Dunn's messages are for personal edification, not to be duplicated, uploaded to the web, or resold without prior written permission. The Ron Dunn Audio Library is managed by Sherwood Baptist Church. For more Ron Dunn materials, including sermon outlines, devotions, scanned pages from a study Bible, books, CDs, MP3s, and DVDs, visit rondunn.com or the Sherwood Baptist Bookstore, The Source. Sermons are also available on the Ron Dunn Podcast.